Okay, I think we'll get underway. Uh, good luck in the test. I'm Roger Wright, and, and I welcome you all to the Design Conversations lecture today. Uh, it's my uh, honor to uh, say a few words uh, introduction for our uh, speaker. Um, Tim Samara is a New York-based graphic designer whose career is focused primarily on visual brand identity and information design. Since 2000, he has, been, he has split his time between professional practice and academia, defining a highly respected reputation as an instructor at Parsons, the New School for Design, University of the Art, Purchase College, Rutgers University, School of Visual Arts, New York University, and FIT. Mr. Samara is a frequent conference speaker, university lecturer, and contributor to design publications, both here and abroad. He's published 10 books on design, and they've been translated into 10 languages, and are used by students, educators, and professionals. And I'm sure many of you have copies of his books in your libraries, as I do. He's currently developing an expansion of visual history on graphic design. So please, uh, Join me in welcoming Tim Samara. Thank you, Roger. Thanks. Thank you, Roger. And first, I'd like to thank uh, not only Roger, but the Vignelli Center and RIT uh, for welcoming me here to speak to you. And of course, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, hopefully, uh, if I don't piss anybody off, uh, I hope that what I have to say will be of value uh, to you. Uh, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, so the. Um, the origin of this uh, presentation is uh, another presentation that I gave uh, in Toronto a few years ago uh, at the RGD Design Educators Conference, uh, which uh, put forth uh, a, a kind of a, a theme uh, that I, I had some uh, trouble wrapping my head around. Um, in looking at the two words uh, and thinking about how I might participate, uh, my, my one reaction was uh, something of bewilderment because these two words to me, education and learning, seem uh, to be kind of the same thing. Uh, and so I submitted an abstract uh, in which I uh, in, uh, thought that the, uh, uh, I characterized the conference's theme as interrogating a cloud of moot and well-understood nebulous issues. Uh, and so I was quite surprised when they actually invited me to come and speak. Uh, and among those uh, were some uh, nuggets of innovative wisdom, uh, which seemed sort of self-explanatory, such as these. Uh, this particular one was uh, an interesting uh, kind of contribution, uh, as I have always understood design to be a social act since it engages uh, constituents in a kind of dialogue with each other uh, in communication. Uh, a number of uh, interesting and sort of tangential, possibly, uh, concerns uh, that seem to obsess uh, about uh, students' uh, participation in their own educational process. Uh, some uh, old canards that I thought had been dealt with in the mid-80s when technology's uh, little happy friend, the Macintosh, first appeared and technology became a, a kind of a, uh, a point of uh, great discussion. And nowhere along the way any kind of uh, concern about how educators are actually addressing what I perceive to be the core fluency of graphic design, that is, the creation, the manipulation, uh, the organization of signs, of symbols, of language, of color, in order to generate some kind of community of knowledge, of narrative, and understanding. Uh, and uh, that really kind of freaked me out. Why wasn't anyone talking about what it is that we as educators do in the classroom and how we might be most effective in transmitting, uh, in inculcating and facilitating a kind of a competency uh, in the future practitioners in the field? Uh, and then this one, of course, which was my uh, favorite standout, um, to which my only response was, really? Uh, and before anybody gets their undies in a knot, uh, 
uh, and accuses me of restorative nostalgia, uh, given that it is the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Bauhaus. Uh, we'll deal with that a little bit later. So I interpreted these uh, kinds of qualities in the discussion, the discourse that was going to unfold uh, as uh, kind of uh, samples of a state of mind that I became familiar with uh, having gone through several years of psychotherapy. Uh, these three primary kinds of states of mind uh, which are indicative of uh, anxiety uh, in general. And so my, my takeaway uh, was that there is some kind of anxiety within uh, the practice and within uh, education itself that must have been precluding uh, what I thought should be a really core major discussion, that is, how do we teach what it is that we do. Uh, and so I attribute, uh, I hypothesize, uh, that this anxiety is, uh, comes from several sources. Uh, which have been uh, growing, burrowing into the minds of both professionals and educators over time in a kind of vicious sort of feedback loop. Uh, and the first of those is newness, that is, the shock of things unknown or perceived to be unknown. Uh, and the first uh, of these was the notion of a kind of uh, a new learner. That is, there is, there was a uh, a thought put forward that somehow, as educators, our ability to engage uh, students uh, somehow had to change because there is some kind of new facility, some kind of new cognitive process involved uh, that has been heretofore unknown. Uh, when, in point of fact, human cognitive processes and the mechanisms by which they uh, uh, are accomplished have not changed in nearly 50,000 years. That is, the Cro-Magnon brain, the Neolithic mind, its ability to parse information, to appreciate, uh, to interpret, uh, and to formulate responses to the world on an intellectual level have remained essentially the same. Uh, the brain has become slightly smaller over time, but even our friend Utzi here, uh, the Iceman found in the Alps, uh, uh, from uh, about five or 6,000 years ago, was cognitively capable of inventing Sputnik. Had he had a need, had his people understood certain aspects of the physical world around them and been able to apply that thinking in a way to meet some kind of goal. That's not to say that Utsi couldn't have done it uh, already. That capacity has been with us for some time. So the notion of a new learner to me uh, is predicated on some other kind of anxiety. Uh, you know, we can see that the making of signs, which extends back to, uh, even prior to uh, Cro-Magnon times, uh, recent discoveries uh, by uh, Genevieve von Petzinger, uh, who is a doctoral uh, candidate uh, in Vancouver, uh, who is studying uh, abstract symbols and sign making that she has discovered in more than 321 sites around Europe, uh, which actually predate uh, most of the cave paintings that, with which we're familiar at Chauvet and uh, Altamira and so on, uh, provide a kind of an underpinning uh, basis uh, for understanding symbolic thought as uh, on a continuum, uh, and which seemingly has not really changed all that much. From iconography that dates to 15 and 20,000 years ago, to current uses of iconography in a digital environment, we are dealing with the same kind of fundamental sign-making communicative capacities uh, that we always have. It's equally interesting that the, with the, the dawn of uh, the digital interface and eventually that of the internet, the networked uh, design space, communication space, uh, is that uh, we have, in essence, uh, returned to a form of communication, a vehicle, a medium, uh, with which we have been familiar for a good 5,000 years. Uh, this, the parchment scroll uh, dates to about uh, uh, 2700 BC, um, and uh, in essence, we are still, uh, despite groundbreaking interdimensional connected work by pioneers in the field like Muriel Cooper at MIT, flying through galaxies of information, uh, we have been reduced to simply scrolling and scrolling and scrolling once again. 
I hypothesize that another source of anxiety among uh, the graphic design establishment is that of the kind of the DIY movement. With the introduction of the computer and the rise of design to the foreground of public consciousness, uh, the accessibility of software and other kinds of learning materials uh, that allow naive or untrained designers or those uh, who simply have an interest to accomplish similar kinds of feat of image making, of typographic expression, uh, of information networking, of storytelling, uh, has given rise to a kind of uh, uh, an anxiety that might revolve around notions of authorship or of uh, uh, sort of the level of training, uh, of competency. Uh, that there is a kind of a blurred line between who is really a designer now if everyone can be. This throws a kind of a question at us, uh, the practicing and educational establishment, uh, as to a certain kind of notion of what our value really then is. If uh, the facility for creating, for making, uh, for narrating, for storytelling, and for disseminating that information, uh, communicating has now kind of bled out from uh, within our own little sacred ivory tower. Within that kind of uh, realm of uh, do it yourself, if, uh, do yourselfness, uh, comes the relatively new notion. Uh, of co-creation, as formulated by Liz Sanders, the designer and theorist, uh, who describes it as a kind of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the participation of non-designing constituencies uh, for the development of content, for providing feedback, uh, for uh, a kind of a level of research uh, that brings in other kinds of makers and thinkers who are kind of impeding us or interfering with our sort of traditionally uh, uh, sort of uh, sort of contained space, uh, sort of stepping on our toes a little bit, if you will. What's interesting about the way that Sanders frames the notion of co-creation specifically uh, is that she refers to it as uh, a kind of a process to undergo a means of tapping into uh, one's constituency for whom one is designing uh, as a kind of research, an extended research uh, that allows the designer to understand more fully, more holistically, more authentically what the needs of the people to whom the designer will be fabricating this object, this system, this interface, this communication vehicle. And so it's really not necessarily in uh, Sanders' view that such people, these co-creators, will necessarily be actually contributing visual material or ideating alongside ourselves, but really function in kind of the same way that historically the focus group did. Uh, focus group, uh, in case you're not familiar with that, is a kind of a, an age-old uh, sort of advertising and branding uh, endeavor uh, in which at the tail end of the development of a campaign uh, some selection of the perceived target audience is invited into a controlled setting to kind of review the campaign uh, and its communications and kind of weigh in on it sort of after the fact. Co-creation is simply that same kind of process but a more proactive one rather than a reactive one uh, and in fact is something that we are not only familiar with in the way in terms of its kind of thinking but is also potentially quite useful. Uh, arguably, if we're able to get input from the people for whom we are going to be developing communication systems at the outset of our process, even prior to visual ideation, that can only be helpful for us. So I feel like there's not really a need for the design establishment to feel any anxiety about that. It's potentially a very, very helpful kind of a process. But further along that kind of notion of participation from outside uh, areas, uh, we get into another kind of uh, sort of thinking uh, developed uh, by uh, Meredith Davis, a uh, designer and theorist and writer uh, who was tasked by the AIGA uh, some years ago to develop a kind of a set of guidelines for where education should go based on uh, sort of trends that she saw sort of developing over time. 
And all of these kinds of uh, these trends, uh, complexity rather than simplicity, uh, scalability, that is looking at the development of communications that can function in a systematic way, both in terms of an object, from the object to a communication interface, uh, from uh, that interface outward into the community, and then in levels and levels of increasing uh, uh, complexity and scale uh, overall. The notion of participation, that is that not only uh, we're sort of beyond what Sanders proposes as co-creation, uh, a kind of uh, actual participation by the, uh, by the constituents uh, in a kind of an ecology where uh, content is not only being assembled or aggregated uh, into various, various platforms, uh, but also uh, reconfigured, uh, fragmented, in order to create new relationships or to reveal relationships of understanding across multiple different kinds of sources, which may have not been uh, understood well before. Um, and that those kinds of systems need to be flexible and adaptable because those systems of information are now no longer top down. That is, in the kind of the industrial model of a message created to uh, that constituency or for that constituency, that that messaging is wrapping their own contributions, their own thoughts, their own image making, uh, their own content development uh, into an ecology that is constantly changing, constantly updating, not object by object, not period by period, but on a continuous uh, and kind of uncontrolled basis. Uh, and in that kind of regard also uh, brings up the notion of curation, uh, that is multiple viewpoints in terms of what is considered valuable, how technology utilizes certain processes like algorithms to either uh, aggregate those, uh, those materials or to direct uh, certain kinds of messaging or desired pieces of information, desired content to a viewer based on their own behavior. Uh, uh, through what they click on, which kinds of uh, uh, sites they might visit. Uh, and then, of course, there's, uh, there is the issue of multiplicity. Uh, that is that now these communications do not happen in one sole location. They are not cited in an object specifically, but that messaging uh, that involves this kind of participation uh, is also straddling multiple media where there are fragments of pieces uh, of uh, narrative that are being shown in, at different levels, in different ways, in different relationships, uh, over time, in different, pl uh, in different places, and for specific people. And she talks a little bit about the notion of sort of dilution and fragmentation. Uh, the, the potential for fragmentation, the loss of continuity and consistency in branded messages. Uh, and to these things, I would say, uh, I don't know of any kind of a system that you could show me. I defy someone, anyone, to present me with a communication system of this magnitude in which all of these kinds of qualities, these necessities, these goals, this adaptability is not fundamentally underpinned by signs, by symbols, by visual cues that allow users, participants, to navigate those different kinds of media, to interconnect them, to build community, and to maintain visual consistency, stylistic consistency, meaningful semantic consistency through the application of form. And in effect, what is happening is, in essence, the kind of fruition of the totality of artistic experience that was first put forth in the first decades of the 20th century, from Morris through the Wiener Werkstätte, through the Deutsche Werkbund, through the work of Frank Lloyd Wright, this notion of all parts of existence being intercommunal, 
interactive in a particular way from the objects in your table to the space in which you live to the formation of a dining room to the cutlery to the literature to the lighting to the views outside we are in essence witnessing that totality coming into being and so it is the notion of a system that we have been familiar with, that has been part of both design practice and design education. The notion of the branded totality that was first expressed by Behrens in 1906 in his work for the uh, Berlin uh, Electrical Manufacturers, AEG, uh, in which he designed not only the products, but the tools that made them, the factories, the factory buildings, all of the communications materials, the storefronts. We already know what this is about. And so we should simply be able to move forward. That does, however, still bring up yet another kind of anxiety that I think uh, has been playing a role over time, uh, especially since uh, the appearance of uh, desktop publishing is that as technology uh, increases its reach, uh, provides us with new possibilities for uh, not only spaces for creation, but also uh, as vehicles for delivery, for networking, uh, is that uh, as educators we are increasingly tasked with teaching more and different kinds of skills. Not only the hand skills needed for generating imagery, painting and drawing and printmaking and so on, hand skills for production, the uh, minutia of typography, uh, the production of typography, uh, various kinds of software for manipulating, transmitting and producing images, but also taking on the responsibility of print production and eventually of coding. Uh, is that to a lesser and lesser degree, uh, we have, uh, or to a greater and greater degree, excuse me, we have uh, kind of uh, sort of forced ourselves, uh, or been forced, uh, to use up a great deal of educational time in transmitting these kinds of hard skills. Uh, is it necessary for graphic designers to be able to draw? No, not necessarily. The advent of uh, digital image making software opened up a very democratic uh, new kind of uh, possibility for people who are not hand skill oriented but who had brains and eyes, intellectual capacities for communicating. Uh, and that's an admirable evolution in uh, the design process. Uh, but the, gra the graduating designer now does in fact need to be able to be accomplished in a variety of skills, uh, even to the point of getting down and dirty into the code. Uh, but still the question remains that regardless of what medium, what delivery vehicle, what kind of interface we're dealing with, whether it's print or the screen or some other as yet unknown uh, vehicle of transmission, uh, is that that coding can get us so far, it allows us to be able to create uh, in real time in that kind of a space and to be able to manipulate material and to advance these kinds of uh, participatory uh, ecologies. Uh, but the question is still, as an uh, instructor of mine asked way back in the 80s, what are we coding? There has to be something to code. First, that is, there must be a subject matter to communicate an idea, a set of information. That information must be given some sort of visual form in order to facilitate its transmission via these various kinds of media. Uh, and in essence, you can't scan an idea. You should try it sometime. It can get a little uh, painful, uh, and it doesn't really get you anywhere. And so one of the things that always disturbs me uh, and continues to disturb me is the sort of notion that as the kinds of media that we are forced to use uh, to do what we do, the kinds of learning that we are forced to undergo, uh, is that 
as new kinds of skills begin to aggregate that we are somehow, it's somehow important to throw away the old ones, that we are just going to lose uh, that kind of underpinning. Uh, keeping in mind that, you know, regardless of what the outcome is, all design processes involve the use of visual stimuli. The process is always about form making. The outcome is always an artifact of some kind that relies on its form in order to do its job. And so, you know, in the same way that uh, you know, the sort of basics of scale relationships, of the, the identity of forms, their uh, optical interactions in space, their semantic as well as visual or formal uh, qualities uh, remain that kind of underpinning, uh, it really sort of has to keep going that way. I don't think that there's any other discipline in the world in which uh, the educators thereof would tell their students, you know, we have all these new kinds of applications, these new contexts for use, these new areas of innovation, uh, but we're just going to throw out the body of knowledge that we've gained for the past hundred years. If that were the case, we could just sort of get, we could ask physicists, you know, I'd like you to develop graphene, uh, but I would like you to ignore the atomic weights of the various uh, elements in the periodic table or how they interact with each other chemically. Why would we do that? It would be impossible. And so if we're going to give that up, we might as well just, you know, sort of go back to the beginning and forget that even gravity exists and start afresh. The second source of anxiety that I think uh, is uh, sort of driving this, uh, this distraction from uh, the sort of the fundamentals of what designing is about is corruption. And by that I mean uh, the uh, sort of commercial adoption or the co-opting of visual communication for the purpose of selling in a capitalist market-based economy. Uh, it's interesting that uh, over the past hundred years, and especially in the period after the Second World War, is that the design establishment worked very, very hard at gaining a seat at the corporate conference table, of making its value known, uh, its intrinsic value known, at the very beginning process of bi uh, processes of business modeling and marketing. Uh, Unimark International uh, is famous uh, for uh, projecting this sense of professionalism uh, in order to uh, transform the designer from a kind of uh, temperamental aesthete, a stylist, into uh, a professional, analytical uh, a doctor uh, of sorts uh, who could solve problems and in doing so uh, elevate uh, their clients' bottom lines. Uh, they're notorious, uh, or infamous as you would like, uh, for showing up at work and to client meetings in white lab coats in order to drive that point home. Uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue, uh, this relationship, this, this uh, necessity of relationship between what is a very, very ancient fundamentally humanistic endeavor that is the communication uh, of ritual narrative, uh, of social binding, uh, of uh, intellectual engagement, uh, of uh, emotional and spiritual uh, growth uh, with uh, the taint of the money. And that fundamentally is something that we have to deal with as graphic design or visual com communication is really uh, one of the children of the Industrial Revolution. That is, as a consumer class grew, so did the use of art and its expertise uh, to facilitate uh, that uh, uh, consumer market-based uh, sort of interaction. And that, that anxiety, that taint of corruption has been something that uh, we designers have been fretting about for decades. Uh, even before Ken Garland first published his First Things First manifesto in The Guardian in 1964, calling for a renewed uh, interest and focus on 
thinking about what it is that we as designers are actually doing. What is the best use of our skills, our expertise, our understanding of how form and language and color communicate. That is, uh, you know, at times we may be, uh, you know, perfectly fine uh, doing things that might morally compromise us for the sake of the dollar, as there is always, there is always a moral compromise implicit uh, in profit making, uh, regardless of what that endeavor happens to be. Uh, and in a lot of cases, we are going to put, uh, we are going to use our skills to sell uh, striped toothpaste and cat litter and so on. Uh, but our calling, uh, as Garland perceived it, as I would argue is st it still is, uh, is a higher one. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's something that we kind of have to deal with. One of the interesting things about this, uh, this commodification of uh, design, especially as design became uh, prominent in the public consciousness, uh, as people began to uh, migrate, young people began to migrate to design programs as a possibility for their own education, uh, is that uh, things began to happen. Uh, suddenly, uh, a huge burst in the number of programs between the 1960s, the 1990s, into the 2000s, in uh, the 2000s, huge increases in class sizes with more schools competing for more students, meaning greater enrollment, meaning smaller class times, meaning that people were looking for ways to get jobs. Students began to monetize uh, their educational experience. What do I get out of this experience? How am I going to get a job and make a living in the world became the paramount uh, uh, concern, uh, because of course they also have to explain to their parents why they're asking for $200,000 uh, for tuition, as you well know, uh, is that you have to be able to explain that and say, yes, I'm going to be able to get a $100,000 job when I get out of here, and I don't really care what I'm doing for the spiritual growth of humanity, or you might, but you still recognize that at the end of the day, there's something going into the wallet. Uh, and I can attest to this kind of this kind of this vicious spiral. And academia is no fool. Uh, you know, in the time that I was teaching at uh, uh, various institutions, let's not name them, uh, beginning in 2001, I saw my class sizes jump from 15 to 20, and then to 25, over enrolled on a regular basis. Uh, the class times at the same time diminishing from six-hour studios to four-hour studios to three-hour studios, and even in some institutions where there was already uh, a, a, this kind of minimal three-hour studio cut down to two hours and 20 minutes. There's not a whole lot that you can accomplish in a two-hour and 20-minute session. It essentially becomes uh, a kind of a top-down critique session. Let me give you as much feedback as I can in as little time as possible. Go away and do stuff. No opportunity to watch the process unfold. No opportunity to interrogate that process and to help uh, students overcome misunderstandings uh, to uh, become confident in the way that they assimilate concepts and skills that are foreign and confusing to them and to the, then to grow uh, that understanding into an extendable and holistic and deeply felt and authentic uh, kind of uh, practice. Oh. And of course, because all of these other tangential concerns are eating up so much time, and because digital software allows for the uninitiated, the untrained, the, the naive at every level to accomplish what appears to be slick, professionally acceptable work, is that the focus on the underpinning of what we do has been relegated to the sidelines. Whoa, let's not do that. Uh, and so, you know, now, you know, it's, it's very hard, I think, for uh, anybody, even professionals, to, ar to argue, uh, to answer the question to a potential client, uh, you know, so-and-so over here, 
you know, they have a computer, uh, they have access to Pinterest, and the first thing they do is go to Pinterest and look up, for, look for ideas like, what should this thing look like? <clears throat> Why, uh, if I can have the, that person uh, accomplish my logo, do my communications uh, for $2,000 or $5,000, why am I going to pay you, highly trained professional, $50,000 when I can get the same thing? And for any, for any uh, you know, sort of naive practitioner who also happens to have a command of business jargon, is savvy in the schmooze, is that the distinction between a competent, professional practitioner with core expertise, with a depth of understanding, the ability to think rather than to simply replicate is totally lost on them. And hence we have uh, you know, the beginnings of, again, or the, the continuation of another kind of degrade, uh, degrading, devaluing, diminishing of what it is that we do uh, in the eyes of the constituents who we are theoretically here uh, to serve. And hence, of course, uh, given that, and because you know, time is of the essence, uh, and because anyone can simply go out and get a template, is like, I would, I, would, I would challenge you. Here's your homework. Hunt down the websites of 100 graphic design studios or agencies in any country of the world, and they're going to look like this. All of them. If I see another one of these kinds of websites for a professional who theoretically should be taking time to craft an experience for me, uh, let alone a unique, specific, directed, authentic, experience on behalf of their clients, I'm going to shoot somebody. <laughs> I mean, why even bother? Uh, and, you know, so here's the thing is, uh, in riding the subway in New York recently, or for the past year or so, I've become aware of this, uh, this latest outgrowth of what has now become the gig economy, uh, not, a, not a, a full practice. Uh, but a kind of an on-demand uh, uh, go-to platform uh, wherein, and I actually looked into it because I was like, well, uh, I could actually uh, enroll and I could offer services and then uh, th while I'm sleeping, clients will come to me asking for things. Do you know what the recommended time frame for developing a project is on this platform if you've never investigated it? and it's a clearinghouse for freelance uh, designers and so on, is two to three days at a price of less than $100. Anyone who is going to develop a logo or a communication with any worth, with any value, in the space of two to three days for $100 is not the kind of person that I want out in the world representing what I do, and nor should you. And in essence, what that whole death spiral does is drag us away from the table, no longer having a seat in those valuable preliminary meetings at the highest levels. We are essentially reduced to a pair of hands once again. So I think underneath all of this, <clears throat> this anxiety with the gun to our heads, I think we'd better stop, wake the f up, and take a deep breath and figure out what we're going to do about it. And the thing that I would suggest is that we need to return to a situation, to a scenario, where those who are experts in the field, those who demonstrate competency, are the ones who define how the future practitioners of that field should be educated, what the means are 
and that those means rely on the eyes. We are visual communicators. We are visual learners. We are visual thinkers, this species that we are a part of. The vast majority of our understanding of the world comes in through our eyes. And so what we really need to deal with is how, as designers, we orchestrate that understanding, provide value and meaning, whether it is solely on a commercial level or it aspires to something more altruistic, something more noble, something more authentic over time. And that kind of study takes patience. It takes time. And so we have to begin to think about education not just as a means to an end, not just a stepping stone to a job and an apartment and a commercial consumer life, but as a real world itself, is that to learn something, to understand something, is not simply a step along the way. It is a thing all by itself. So I always hate to ask this question, because it brings up a whole can of worms. Whose definition? Uh, and there are some good ones out there, and we've seen them before. This is a, a nice one by Jessica Helfand that kind of captures two sides of it, uh, the situation. The first part of it is a more prosaic, kind of descriptive uh, kind of definition of sort of what it is. Uh, you know, sort of in its, in its fundaments and its relationship to culture and so on. And then the second part of it is really the, the blockbuster, uh, uh, is uh, the kind of the, the, the sense of uh, that kind of ritual and narrative kind of component uh, of it that trades on languages that are created through uh, the creation, the manipulation, the aggregation, the organization of shapes and lines and textures and patterns and words and so on. Uh, she uh, borrows a little bit from uh, Paul Rand, who himself borrows, uh, borrowed uh, a little bit from Eric Gill, uh, who ultimately borrowed from Aristotle's poetics. And I think that, uh, you know, the sort of the, we often overlook the primacy, uh, uh, the unavoidable uh, kind of component, the elemental essence uh, of, of what it is to make something. Uh, and that is it all happens through the eyes. Uh, and in, a, in this uh, case, I think very, very well described by uh, Dr. Richard Buchanan uh, of Case Western Reserve University, uh, formerly uh, the design chair at Carnegie Mellon, uh, who has uh, configured, describes design as the balance between, achieving a balance between three sort of fundamental components uh, aspects of the artifact and he or the interface and he speaks generally uh, in terms of the digital interface uh, as uh, or the, the the machine interface but I think it's a, a kind of a thinking that is applicable to any kind of object anything which creates uh, a kind of a point of interactivity between uh, one of us and the thing that we're going to use in some way whether it's an object whether it's a communication system whether it's a poster and so on uh, and uh, uh, which he refers to uh, in this in this means the triangle of doom and the three uh, sort of aspects uh, that the designer uh, among which the designer must strike a balance are the aspects the aspects of the thing's usefulness uh, its usability uh, and its desirability usefulness uh, is that the artifact the thing uh, is actually going to help us uh, achieve some sort of a goal, whether it is to learn something, uh, to be able to facilitate some new understanding, to be able to open a can, uh, to be able to uh, protect us from the weather and so on, is that in its form it makes its functionality known. In its form it also must be usable, that is the form itself must facilitate our ability to use that thing in a way that is intuitive, that is understandable, that works with the way our bodies, our minds, our eyes work that we can understand how this thing will help us accomplish that goal. And interestingly, the last is desirability. 
uh, which I find quite telling that he places at the base of the tripod. Uh, the desirability of it is the narrative component. How does this thing resonate with me in a contextual way, in an emotional way, in a symbolic way, in a narrative way, in a meaningful way? And how, by that form, do I become engaged on an intellectual and emotional level enough to understand how to use it and to recognize its value, the value of its function, its usefulness at the same time? And what he's really talking about is the form of the thing. The way the thing is constructed, the way it makes use of material, of symbology, of iconography, of color, of tactility, of overall proportion. It's those qualities that, in essence, compel us to either pick up that object, buy it, and use it, and make it part of our lives, or to turn it aside. That is, it's the form that allows us to understand what its function is. It's the form that allows us to see how to use it, to understand the implications of its meaning. And it sort of boils down to a very, very old, very, very common colloquial colloquialism. It's an interesting piece of our lexicon that should tell you everything you need to know about how important form is in our lives. Meaning does not exist until we are able to see it. Meaning is not important to us until it resonates with us, until it compels us through the dynamism of its optical experience, its engagement with our intellectual processes through cognition, It's all about form. So let's have a little therapy ourselves. Interrogate. So uh, I return to that issue of uh, you know, the, the celebration of 100 years of the Bauhaus. And there are a lot of people who are now very, very happy about that. But for the past 10 years or so, uh, the question of, uh, from a number of fronts, you know, why do we need this kind of studio-built sort of, you know, sort of basic form composition sketching model? It doesn't really further uh, how the design process unfolds, especially when you're dealing with uh, digital technology and sort of systems adaptability and all these other kinds of engineering, practical, contextual concerns, and so on. Uh, it's, it's, it's that thinking, uh, that thinking which underpins everything, and there, it, there, is, a, there is a track record uh, for it. And so uh, there's, a, there, there's, a, there's an argument out there uh, that Carrie Jacobs and um, his mother's posed a while ago that's relationship uh, of certain kinds of nostalgia. Uh, that is, there are two kinds, the restorative kind, that is, looking back to a past that could not have been, never was, uh, has been lost in order to enforce a kind of a new traditionalism that is sort of blindly pulling that past forward. It's the kind of, of nostalgia that drives uh, nationalism, populism, uh, white supremacism, and so on. Uh, and then there's the, re the, refl uh, the reflective kind, in which we look at that, what has gone before, as the building of a body of knowledge upon which we can reflect, upon which we, uh, of which we can interrogate, and from that body of knowledge to begin to innovate new directions based on the core fundamental qualities of what that kind of methodology is, what that kind of human endeavor is. And I, you know, I remind you again of sort of the notion of physics and the period of uh, uh, the periodic table uh, of elements, is that you cannot innovate in physics until you understand how chemistry works. There's no getting around it. So I don't look at what has come before the hundred plus years of building that knowledge uh, as nostalgia, I see it as evidence. And that evidence has been building up since the aftermath of the Industrial Revolution uh, with Macintosh and the McDonald sisters, uh, 
at Pratt, 1901, uh, Henri Vandevelde and the Weimar School of Arts and Crafts in both iterations uh, as the uh, newly reincarnated Bauhaus, which then moved to Dessau uh, at Black Mountain College after the, uh, the diaspora of designers and artists uh, from Nazi Germany uh, to Zurich uh, to Basel and onward building this periodic table of fundaments in which we understand how point, line, and plane act, how color affects our physiognomy, uh, how uh, rhythm can be achieved and the illusions of spatial depth acquired uh, and transmitted uh, through uh, solely abstract visual means. It's a very, very strong, interwoven, interconnected, well-researched, body of knowledge. Top of mind for me recently, uh, since uh, I, am a, I am a graduate of the University of the Arts in Philadelphia, formerly PCA, and some of you may have been uh, lucky to see my mentor and instructor, Ken Hebert, speak here a couple of months ago. Uh, in 66, after he was the first uh, American um, to graduate from the School of Design in Basel, uh, under the tutelage of Armin Hoffman and Emil Reuter, uh, he formed a new program, uh, really a kind of a hybrid translation of the sort of the European model uh, of design thinking and uh, pedagogy, uh, sort of merged with a sort of an American playfulness and practicality. Uh, and in doing so, formulated a set of principles uh, that act as a really, really strong roadmap uh, for how to build a design curriculum and how to facilitate uh, a, a kind of a process of building understanding in students that is not only very, very specific, scaffolded in a structured evolutionary way, uh, but which is also completely open-ended. One of the things that uh, a lot of people uh, misinterpret about uh, those kinds of pedagogical approaches, in particular the kind of uh, European uh, modernist sausage party type, uh, is that there's a dogma involved, is that there's only one way to do it. Uh, and if you are really, really kind of looking at the kind of the theories and philosophies that are embodied by uh, uh, that body of knowledge, by those thinkers, by those uh, 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 designers, is that it is not about uh, one way to do it. Uh, and then uh, further on, uh, you know, uh, if any roadmap actually exists, is this uh, a kind of diagram of every course, every project, and what specific kinds of understanding were to be accomplished in each one, uh, developed by Thomas Ockerse at, um, at RISD in 1977 after several years of managing that department and directing it. Uh, and it looks like a formula But what it really is, is a means for inquiry. We often have, or many people often have, the misconception that modernism, uh, in the way that we understand it, your first go-to is, oh, Zurich International Style, Helvetica, grids, uh, uh, descriptive photography, uh, no individuality, but we forget that modernism entails a whole range of explorations beginning in the late 19th century that moved in a number of different directions. Some looking at, you know, cubism, futurism, constructivism, the style, uh, vorticism, surrealism. Uh, all of these movements attack the same question from a variety, expressionism, uh, it goes on, from completely different vantage points, but there's one thing that they share, that they all have in common, and that is the notion of how do I understand the basics of form and how do I interrogate those in order to find ways of expressing modernity to develop meaningful communications, experiences that express certain kinds of ideas that are uh, personal and sometimes uh, more sort of outward looking. Uh, all of these kinds of expressions are modernism, uh, and it's a point that I made in a panel discussion 
uh, in which I participated about the work of Vaughn Oliver, uh, who is generally uh, cast within uh, the, uh, the sort of the postmoderns, uh, especially in his work for 4 AD, uh, in which we see here a kind of uh, uh, an agglomeration of approaches that draws very readily from constructivism, from expressionism, from typography at the Bauhaus, Inton's color theory, uh, all kinds of things, but it's, it's not a kind of a lift that is, it's not a ripoff, it is a sharing of a similar kind of thinking. That is, how do I find somewhere to go by ripping apart, recombining, uh, aggregating, recurating of uh, certain kinds of gestures in my own way for my own uh, and uh, uh, communication purposes and so on. And when we're talking about these kinds of formal uh, issues, uh, we're not really just talking about the surface. Yes, the surface upon which or through which we recognize a grouping of, a selection of shape elements, dots, lines, planes, textures, and patterns, uh, the way that they behave in space, uh, is that uh, those are the means by which we are to be able to understand things. We can understand by, 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 by just sort of you know, feeling it in our heads. There has to be some kind of an entry point. How do we get information in order to then be able to process it and act upon it? And form is the stimulus that must precede every intellectual endeavor, every intellectual activity if it is going to be something that is transmitted from one human to others, at least in the way that we think about it as designers. So it's worth noting that there are things that we have to look at, point, line, and plane. I know that all of you, I hope, can recognize that some of the objects in your frame of reference right now are larger than others and smaller than others, and that some advance in space and that some recede in space. And we all know which ones those are, and that's because form is not personal. The interpretation of form is hardwired into us on a nearly genetic level. All human children begin to draw at about the age of two. There's a very, very extensive study done by uh, a woman, uh, Rhoda Kellogg, who's a child psychologist and educator in San Francisco in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, who amassed drawings from, uh, I believe, 8,000 young children from the ages of two to the ages of eight across every continent from every culture. And interestingly, she discovered, after amassing 11 million of these drawings, is that every child, regardless of cultural background, begins drawing in the same way at the same time, follows a specific pattern of investigation of mark making on the page, first in the center, then to the side, then top to bottom, into the diagonals, into aggregates, begins to combine those forms, and from that comes, at a later date, at five or six or seven, a kind of figuration that develops uh, in a completely independent and universal way. The way that humans perceive objects in space is how they understand whether or not something is stationary or moving, whether it's near or far, whether it's two of the same thing or two different things and whether or not one of those things is coming to eat us. We rely on identifying things by their shape. And so, you know, when people say form is easy, uh, I, I invite them to, to, to go through the kind of the investigation that I went through with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dot exercises. Uh, for several months, looking at every possible way that dots of first the same size and then multiple sizes and then touch, not touching, then touching, then overlapping and changing in value, interacted with each other to understand, you know, the material, the clay with which I would be working. And it took a while. And to be able to ascertain from within those different kinds of interactions what kinds of relationships occur between forms of similar and also of different kinds. What kinds of tension are created in the relationship of contrast between something that is dot-like and linear, or planar, or flat 
or volumetric, something that is simple or complex, something that is heavy or light, something is uh, opaque or transparent, something that is grouped and ordered, or something that is isolated and irregular, something that is geometric versus something that is organic. That base study is critical in the educational process of a designer, of a visual communicator, in being able to facilitate a discovery process in which that communicator is able to pinpoint, to define valuable relationships and then to invent from within a particular kind of set of relationships for the purpose of developing a communication. On the purely formal level first, before we begin to look at meaning. These are examples from a form study aiming towards the discovery of a particular language uh, to be uh, kind of not only defined, but then clarified, refined, and made knowable, understandable at a glance to deal with issues of complexity and simplicity and all those kinds of contrasts. The process starts in the upper, uh, in the upper left where the student has no idea what the they're doing. And it's important for the instructor initially not to tell them what they're doing. Say, your end goal is to create a dynamic and compelling intellectually and optically engaging experience where there is some kind of understanding to be found using some kind of form. Through iterative investigation, through multiple rounds of failure and testing, the student arrives at forms that appeal to them, forms that begin to suggest relationships that they can identify, forms that begin to coalesce into a particular kind of syntax that is the letters and words of the language that they're going to be using, and then some kind of a behavior among them that can formulate a particular sort of experience of that thing in space over time through reflection. So as you travel down from the left-hand side, you see this isolation from a multitude of sort of uh, disparate forms into a kind of a line language, the coalescing of that into different sort of weights and the way that they might potentially interact as sets of diagonals. And then, therefore, as they overlap or join or obliterate each other, how those different kinds of things, those relationships give rise to a particular kind of a logic. In this process, by forcing a student to invent that experience, to understand, define, and transmit that logic all on their own, we serve a several very, very important purposes. And the first is that we are not imposing a certain kind of dogma or thought process on them. They, you, figure it out for yourselves. In doing that, we also engender not only a joy of discovery, but a confidence in the student's own ability to invent material, a confidence in their ability to articulate it, and a confidence in their ability to connect, to empathize with others. That is, how do I make something that's in my head understandable to other people? Which is the crux of communication. To know others, you must first know yourself. Interestingly, in this process, uh, what becomes really, really profoundly uh, recognizable in students, you know, the, the kind of the light bulb, the sort of the aha moment that educators dream of, uh, is the ability to think outside of that process, to, know, to notice other kinds of things that happen either accidentally or as part of some tangential process that's not really related to the, act, to the actual image making itself. Uh, and then to be able to know, to be able to make the connection between that thing, that is to be able to extend that understanding to something that was not anticipated, which is what learning is, to be able to anticipate the unknown and to address it. Whereas training, vocation, is to understand only the known. In this case, the student was making some tests with a ruling pen in order to try and get a line weight right and realize that that language offered possibilities that she had not noticed before. 
and then began to build that language in an entirely new way, an evolutionary way, that eventually resulted in this. So at that arrival point, the entire process unfolds and incorporates from beginning to end a series of decisions that are the sole propriety of that person. No one else. You don't need to go to Pinterest to get an idea. The ideas exist within you, and you should feel confident and strong and uh, enough to let that happen and to celebrate it. This is where the personal becomes the universal. And we're after something that is not finite, the ability to anticipate other kinds of problems or techno technological shifts that have not yet occurred yet. We want something that can be extended. And so after that, that uh, logic is uh, where the question is posed, from within the logic of this system that you have created, interpret some kind of a narrative. And the narrative here is entirely visual. It's a calming down, it's a simplification, it's a lightening of effect, it's a change in transparency and depth to opacity and flatness. But in those transformations, in the behavior of form elements, we begin to see things that intimate meaning. More on that later. And it also happens with type. So it's interesting here, this is a project that I give on occasion, uh, kind of a basic type element, it's a you know, postage stamp, it's a very thinly veiled uh, sort of morphological study, you begin with one weight, one typeface, devise a hierarchy, devise a language, devise a set of rules. The adaptability of it is enforced, no two compositions in the series can be the same layout, but the logic has to be the same throughout. In each round, a new variable is introduced, supporting graphic elements, changes in weight, changes in scale, changes in typeface, the addition of uh, suggestive abstract uh, elements uh, each time, uh, eventually building into color. And you see that from this kind of kernel, this neutral, faceless material comes a visual expression that is not only clear and adaptable and reproducible, but also completely unique to the student. And it happens again here. A totally different set of decisions yielding an experience that is as dynamically deep and interesting, complex, and resolved as the previous, but a completely different, unique, personal approach that is universal and unique become one. And this is not simply about the beauty of things, it's about the very substance. The one thing I think that we have to be careful of as educators and even as designers, especially you know, as both, is to divorce form from content. Form is not simply the veneer of information, it embodies information. Again, we identify and understand things by virtue of the way that they look, the way that they behave in space. And so as the student goes through this trajectory, experiences this trajectory of understanding and commanding visual relationships, those visual relationships also begin to suggest meaning. There is a difference between a circle and a square as a form in terms of its meaning, at least in terms of the meanings that we as a group or any constituency will project on those forms devoid of any context. A circle is fundamentally organic. It's the moon, it's the sun, it's the earth, it's the cell, it's the womb, it's continuity, it's the cycle of the seasons, it's the droplet of rain, it is eternity and continuum. In contrast, the square is entirely artificial. It is structure, it is architecture, it is mathematics, it is equivalences in proportion that do not occur in nature, it is entirely human made. And in that, the student also realizes that form makes a claim. The organization of those forms and the relationships that they, they elicit 
begin to also suggest relationships that we can associate with physical objects or kind of concrete day-to-day -day experience, whether something becomes isolated, whether something becomes dominated, whether something becomes differentiated, whether or not we introduce hierarchy, which, which suggests some kind of power uh, imbalance, uh, and so on. Even when we're dealing with pictorial matter, a change in the form of the image and the depiction will render different kinds of interpretations. And so given this library of understanding, this, this broad base of knowing how forms begin to affect other forms, is that we can then also very specifically alter, manipulate the meanings of images that appear truthful and almost impenetrably concrete and true, that is photographs. The burned edges of the book at the top suggest something very different from the pixelated images at the bottom. And even on a very prosaic level, you know, very often we are called uh, to be able to assimilate, to aggregate, to combine images of very, very different subject matters or from different sources, and being able to recognize form parodies, that is, equivalences, relationships in shapes, in texture, and so on, allow us to support those differences in meaning delivered by each image, either in sequence or as a totality, but then to also generate a totality of experience, that is, unity or cohesion. Uh, it also allows us to invent, that is, to straddle the continuum between the absolutely concrete naturalistic depiction of things and abstract uh, sort of evocations of activity as in this translation of a fish which not only describes the structure of the fish but also by virtue of its translation suggests its swimming in the water, the movement of the fins, the surrounding flow of current all in a highly reduced singular icon. Forms mean things and even at the level of abstraction, we can communicate ideas about architecture, of unity, of intimidation, of dissolution, of sensuality, of precision, of effervescence, of technology, of mapping, of protection, of conflict. And so there is really no limitation. There is not one way to make Forms do things. It's not our jobs as educators to inculcate a specific visual vocabulary. That is, to turn you into clones of constructivist modernists, using only dots, lines, grid-based forms, planar material, and so on. What you do with that form is up to you, and it is also the question asked by the communication itself. The subject matter drives that decision-making process. Knowing what you know about how form works allows you to answer the question, how do I communicate this particular idea? Whether you happen to be philosophically or aesthetically personally drawn to certain kinds of modernist gestures or something that is entirely uh, vernacular based or is very, very hand generated uh, is really not the question. I don't care. Your teachers should not care. What is important is that you understand how to use form in order to get the job done. And as long as the job is getting done, the form uh, that it takes, the outcome, is entirely up to you. It allows uh, for radically different kinds of expression. It allows for personal image making. In particular, uh, I find a really, really strong strategy is to uh, not allow students to appropriate image from any source, that it all has to be absolutely original, uh, including photography, which is very, very challenging sometimes when you need a photo of X and you don't have access to X. How do you evoke the idea of X photographically if that medium happens to make sense? Uh, it allows us to move beyond uh, uh, the, the kind of the conventions of templated, professionally appropriate or acceptable design solutions to avoid pastiche, to engage people in new and interesting ways, newly invented ways to be able to innovate regardless of the medium, whether it's web or something sequential uh, and editorial like a book. <laughs> 
uh, and whether it involves several kinds of information display to be able to aggregate and curate some kind of interaction between typography, abstract expressionism, uh, data graphics, uh, and uh, pictorial symbolic depiction at the same time. It's not that I want, would want, or would even suggest that returning to reinvigorating, renewing uh, the search uh, for, this uh, for this competency to grow this facility, the core fluency of our discipline in one particular way, to pull it back uh, among us, to make it unknowable and unusable by others, to keep it for ourselves, it is to be able to do that on behalf of the world at large, which is ultimately the goal of the communicators, uh, to be able to see the macro and the micro, to be able to see the interconnections of ideas, of media, of messages, of people, of the meaning of their lives, to find the totality that joins them together in whatever those systems may be. And so my call to arms is, O oh, design educators, let us take our competency, our expertise, back into the ivory tower. Let us investigate the evidence and rethink or rework as necessary. Let us define how what we do should be taught rather than have what we do and how it should be taught defined by these outside forces. Let's get out from under the wheel and get behind the wheel and start driving forward again. Thank you. <laughs>